I walk a straight line, shackle and chain. Oh, gruesome Gertie is calling my name. There is no mercy in this penitentiary. Just ask the Hill String Gang, Wrangler. Hey everyone, and welcome back to Bloody Angola, a podcast 142 years in the making. Complete story of America's bloodiest prison. And I'm Jim Chapman. And I'm, what do you know? And I'm glad you're here. Yeah, I'm glad <laughs> to be back. Thank you for covering me, bro. Uh, uh, what a fire series, and I was just listening to it again, uh, the second part, um, right before, we, before I walked in to record this, and that uh, Wilbert story is just absolute fire. Oh, yeah. And the numbers prove it, and you did a hell of a job. It was well, very well put together, and I appreciate it covering Thank it. Thank you. Um, let me give a shout out real quick to the I did the Louisiana Probation Parole Officer Association conference last week, and I didn't wasn't aware, but that several of them live on the B line still. So oh. say like my grandfather did. Yeah. And so the uh I got to meet some of those guys and they were really cool and they enjoy the show Bloody Angola. So I'm gonna give a shout out to them and all of them that are listening up there. Hundred percent. Right? So. Shout out to those guys. Thank you for listening. Yep. Uh and how was that? It was, it was great, that man. Got great people from they had every office from across the state of Louisiana represented there. Wow. Uh, which was a lot. Yeah, I can you imagine. think of how, how many prob- probation offices and parole offices there are, uh, it, even like East Feliciana, you know, mm. the smallest Clinton is. They had that one, and they, they call it the Feliciana office, and they, they do, you know, because DCI is in East Feliciana, and yeah. and then the, the mentally insane hospital, criminal mental insane right. hospital is there and whatever, whatever. And this, there's, there's so much more than we just think about a parole officer visiting a, a convict that got it, got out. They, they, you know, they offer all these different types of programs and everything else. It's pretty interesting. Very but good. Great people. <laughs> and, great and supporters of the show, which yeah, we yeah, always right, like, right? right? I love it. Hey, that's huge. And then we're yeah. I'm talking about the, that's the reason I got invited to speak there and, and be the judge for the cook off and stuff is because, um, you know, Sean and, and them are top fans. Yeah. Right? So it was yeah. awesome. Love it. Love it. Well, we're going to get into uh, today's episode. And one of the topics that always seems to spark debate, y'all, is capital punishment. And regardless of what side you are on that debate, one thing for certain is that the history of the electric chair is one of the probably most interesting topics. If you listen to this show, you're, I'm sure you're into that. Uh, and that's what we're going to cover in detail on today's episode. Now, much of the research that was obtained for this episode, uh, I was able to obtain from Angolites, actually. Right. And these, and you just spoke of Wilbert Rideau, Woody, right. and uh, the majority of this information it was was uh, inspired by articles that he wrote. Uh, personally, so if you hadn't heard the yeah, Wilbur Rideau go episodes, go go listen. They're very really, interesting. Really interesting. The electric chair was first used in New York on August the sixth of eighteen ninety. Now that's a long. That's been a minute, y'all. Oh. To execute William Kimmler, who had killed his wife with an axe. Not much was known about electricity at the time, but the country was trying to get a 
away from the public hangings, and there was a good reason for that, y'all. Hangings were getting pretty gruesome uh, prior to the use of electric chair, and it was not uncommon for heads to become completely separated from the bodies. Oh, my and God. They, but the, they didn't get the weight right, right? Yeah. So when you hang somebody, the— um, when you hang somebody, the hangman has to have the body weight right to counterweight to hang you. Sure. But, uh, and they would line people up, and somebody my size and somebody weighs 200 pounds different. Well, if you, put, you know, I go after them, their weight's going to rip your head off. Wow. But anyway, um, then there was the issue of instant death when it came to hangings. Many times the condemned individual would just hang there, twisting and turning in agony many for 10 to 15 minutes before they eventually die. And that would be the hangman not getting enough weight in, y'all. Um, occasionally, the rope would break, and the condemned would be picked up off the ground. Can you believe this? And <laughs> marched back up the gallows, as they were called, and they'd do it again. All of this was done in public at the time, and hangings drew quite a crowd. It was a big deal with entire families, including children, witnessing the event. And then, y'all, they did this. I mean, they sold popcorn. It was a big it was usually done in the courthouse square. Yeah, they didn't have TV back right, then. Yeah, right. I mean, that was your entertainment, that was your entertainment, as crazy as it sounds. And at the time, the thought process was if executions were done in public, it would deter crime, which is why parents uh, almost always brought their, along their kids. And can you imagine that scare them? Like, yeah. you don't do your homework. That's you what's going to gonna happen to you. Your eyes are going to pop out your head. <sighs> the um, thing was parents saying, if you screw up, this is what will happen to you. And it's interesting to note that the last execution uh, by hanging was actually in Kentucky, and it occurred in 1936, and it, it drew over 20,000 people to watch. Bro, that hanging. is a rock people concert. Love, nothing sells like, like fucking 20,000 like, people. Yeah, and, and I bet you it'd be a lot more today if they did it. But as I said, they became botched, and more and more public outcry had uh, many of the states looking for – different methods of execution. And, and in 1886, in New York, the governor appointed a committee to discover just this, and then they actually considered lethal injection, but not the same as it was done today, as it's done today. They were looking at, uh, into injecting acid <laughs> into the veins. Now, but that's what I mean. You must have chopped the fucking Oh, head. my gosh. That would be worse. Death by fire squad was also considered, but was seen at the time by society as a whole as being uncivilized. Mm -hmm. But like injecting acid either. not right, so bad. Right. Crazy. I wonder who's going to try the acid out first. Ugh. The new solution uh, known as the chair in those days actually was discovered by accident. And due to the newness of electricity, there were tons of deaths surrounding uh, learning technology. You know, y'all figure it out. You know, yeah, yeah, electricity. They Everybody didn't know what knows it did now. Don't then. put a, 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 a you know your iron in, in near your bathtub, right? And right. fall in. So, but anyway, it was actually these deaths and the spark created when the individual was shocked that gave Thomas Edison the idea of the light bulb, as well as New York the idea for the electric chair. And it was Edison himself that urged the adopting of what would be known as the nation's first electrical death act which was signed into law on June 4th, 1890. And I you, mean, it's as soon as you get electricity. Yeah. Like, yeah. And, you know, you said something there about you made the comparison of an iron in a bathtub. Yeah, right. You know, the the only way they knew that that was bad yeah, is somebody dropped happen. an iron no, in a bathtub. Like uh, all the policy procedures, every rule in there is because somebody screwed something up. Yeah. I mean, it happened, right? The, uh, but you just know what you didn't know. Now, what was not public known at the time was that Edison was in a major feud with another inventor by the name of George Westinghouse. And You've heard of it. Yeah, names, everybody's right? heard of Westinghouse. Um, Appliances. Who, who had his own electric company. Now, Edison was a proponent of what is known as the DC current or direct current, which was expensive to produce, while Westin, Westinghouse was a proponent of AC or alternate current, which was much cheaper and more effective at killing someone much more effective and thus more appealing to New York as it relates to electricity for the electric chair. However, what Edison did not realize is that he really had no competition at all. Weston House was opposed to capital punishment completely. And when the state of New York saw his services due to the cost being cheaper, Weston House said, 
go pound sand. I'm not mm-hmm. doing it. I don't believe in death penalty. Edison, knowing that Weston House AC uh, current machine, known as the Dynamo, was much more reliable at actually killing people, that he had uh, he had a trusted friend from another company purchase a Dynamo, then ship it to Edison, and it was actually Weston House's machine that was used to execute Kimmler. Although Edison never told anyone, it was not discovered until years later. Yeah. It's and crazy, right? It, it's, it is crazy. And Edison, you would never think, had a, such a hand in that. Yeah, but, yeah. hell, he was the – back in those days, he was the he, guy when it came yeah, to electricity. Yeah, and he invented so many different things. Yes. Like the record player and, I mean, you name it, he did it. That's it right. The light bulb. Like light bulb, yeah. Yeah. So when the switch was pulled on Kimmler, y'all, as you would expect, it was news all over the country. And a reporter who witnessed it actually uh, discussed what he saw. And just listen to this. The first execution by electrocution has been horror. Doctors say the victim did not suffer. Hmm. Only his maker knows if this is true. To the eye, it looked as though he were in convulsive agony. The current had been passing through his body for 15 seconds when the electrodes at the head were removed. Suddenly, the breast heaved. There was straining at the straps which bound him. A purplish foam covered the lips and were spattered on the leather headband. The man was alive. Warden, doctors, guards, everybody lost their wits. They There was a startling cry for the current to be turned on again. The rigor of death came on the instant. An odor of burning flesh and singed hair filled yeah, the room. That's, that smells like that. For a moment, a blue flame played about the base of the victim's spine. Right. This time, electricity flowed for four minutes. Wow. Kimmler was dead. Part of his brain had been baked hard. Some of the blood in his head had been turned to charcoal. That's crazy. Uh, I mean, the, yeah, I, of the descriptiveness of that. Throwing up. Yeah, yeah, it's this very it, descriptive. First guy to be mm-hmm. uh, executed. Another mishap occurred by electrocution. Another mishap occurred just three years later, y'all, in 1893. William Taylor was strapped into New York's electric chair for killing a fellow inmate. Now, when the electricity hit him, his legs stiffened and ripped off the front of the chair where his ankles were strapped. With no support, the chair fell on top. It's fe- on top of his face with Taylor still strapped in. The warden screamed for the electricity to be turned off and witnesses lifted the chair to which Taylor was found. Still alive. The switch was thrown again, and nothing happened. The generator had burned up. The warden unstraps Taylor and places him on a cot where he was given painkillers. They got the chair put back together, but in the meantime, Taylor died in the cot. (laughs) And if that don't tell you enough, here's another crazy one. A judge on the scene determined that the law had not been carried out, so... The warden orders the dead man back into Uh, the chair, and the current was turned on again for 30 more seconds, even uh, though he was already dead. The warden at that point wipes his brow and says, gentlemen, justice. That's crazy, crazy, crazy. And you know, I think about it, and these are really horrific accounts, no doubt about it, but I also go back and think about Mm, that was really justice. I mean, if these people were legit uh, guilty, they, their victims well, certainly yeah. suffered worse. Kimmler right? attacked his wife with an axe. I don't yeah, think right, she yeah. enjoyed that too right, much. Right. So anyway, y'all, uh, let's go closer to home, okay? In Bloody Angola. the Well, let's get closer to Bloody Angola. Until 1940, Louisiana used hangings as a form of execution. That's and think about that. Yeah, nineteen forties. Wasn't that long ago, right? But I mean, almost in my dad's lifetime, right? Um, the hangings would take place in the parish where the prisoners was was convicted, and we've told y'all about this before uh, with the electric chair. But we'll get to it in a second. So, in June of nineteen forty, the law was changed to execution via an electric chair, but Louisiana did not own an electric chair. And really had no idea how to buy one. It wasn't like you go to Sears and Roebuck catalog and 
get an election. Yeah, right. or go on, go on Google. Yeah, or, yeah, on Google or, or Amazon, eBay, eBay. So it was stipulated in a law that until one year from the date of the law change, they could continue with the hangings. And the last hanging in Louisiana occurred on March seventh uh, of nineteen forty, which is what fifty, sixty, seventy, eighty, ninety, and then. Fuck, that's like 80, yeah, 80, 80, 80, 80, 80, plus, 80, years. 80 plus yeah. years. So um, on March 7th, 1940, when four men were executed for the murder uh, of Frank Hartman following the, the escape from an Arkansas prison, the radio station actually covered the event live, and the men were hanged one after the other, right? Get your money's worth. Louisiana finally received the portable electric chair in July of 1941, the chair was made from oak and came retrofitted to the truck that would carry it from parish to parish. Just two months later, the chair would operate for the first time when Eugene Johnson, and we told you all about this before, sat in gruesome Gertie for the death of a Livingston Parish farmer named Stephen Bench. The very first one happened right here in the parish, yeah. actually in the courthouse square where I worked for so many years um, when my Texas office was. Anyway, we covered that story in a prior episode, along with the execution of Willie Francis, when he murdered a druggist in St. Martin Parish, and some pretty crazy stories. So go listen to Gruesome Gertie, if you haven't done so, to hear early stories of Louisiana's electric chair, Gruesome Gertie, and I actually sat in Gruesome Gertie. Yeah, and some witnesses to several of the traveling executions in Louisiana were really good at describing them. Now, back during... These times, the writers just were amazing right, at yeah, describing yeah, yeah. these yeah, things. Totally and, different. And one witness to a traveling execution in Louisiana said, the hands turned red, then white, and the cords of the neck stand out like steel bands. Wow. Then the limbs, face, fingers, and toes contort. Yeah. The force of the current is so powerful that the prisoner's eyeballs popped out onto his cheeks. That is amazing. Wow, that's like Beetlejuice stuff. Yeah. The prisoner then defecates and yeah. urinates and vomits blood and drool. Yeah, that's what you get. I mean, yeah. they just didn't know electricity yeah. at that time. Yeah, they just cooked them up. Another blew, tribe blew them up. Yeah. Uh, and another traveling uh, execution witness described this. The body turned bright red as the temperature rises and the flesh swells and the skin stretches to the point of breaking. The prisoner caught fire and it sounded like bacon frying and smelled like burning uh, flesh. And none smells like burning flesh. You'll never forget it. If you smell it, I've had to smell it too many times. So eventually, in the 1950s, due to the sheer horror of publicly held executions, the state of Louisiana decided to follow the lead of other states at that time, and they wanted to hold some their executions in private. Right. Uh, in preparation of this, Louisiana State Penitentiary added on to the newly constructed Red Hat cell block, and that was on May 31st of 1957. Uh, they had where they held the first execution at the Red Hat, and that was a prisoner by the name of John Michael. Yep. Now, in 1953, John Michael was convicted of raping a woman during Mardi Gras. It was the first death warrant, uh, oddly enough, signed by Governor Huey P. Long. A total of 10 executions would take place at the Red Hat over the next four years. Right. The last to be executed at the Red Hat was a guy by the name of Jesse James Ferguson, who was convicted of the rape and murder of an 11-year-old girl. His last words before the executioner threw the switch in the Red Hat was, don't let it hurt me. This was in 1961, and it would be the last execution carried out by the state of Louisiana until 1983. That's crazy. And, and, and think about that, him saying, don't let it hurt. Don't me, but he let raped it hurt. He the 11 year old girl. Um, so let's go to Robert Wayne, Wayne Williams, and he became the 11th person executed by the gruesome Gertie in. Uh, and by 1990, the Louisiana executions climbed to 19, while the United States count had rose to 141. So back then, 
per capita really was kind of low. But in 1991, Louisiana followed the, the lead of other states as well and removed to lethal injection as the form of execution. Lethal injection was seen as a much more humane form of execution, but the story leading up to the switch is where it's at. So an attorney focused on getting Louisiana to switch from the electric chair attained photographs of the execution of Robert Wayne Williams and had what would be considered as the leading uh, physiologist and urologist in the country, who was also the top expert on electric chair review the photos. Uh, and y'all, after he, he reviewed them, his belief was in that the suffer rate is high with electric executions, led, and it led directly to the change amid public pressure. Also exasperating the situation was the fact that the Angola Light published several uh, post-execution photos of Robert Wayne Williams. Incidentally, we have those actual photos, and, and Jim's going to be posting them on Patreon page for subscribers. And look, they are, you know, I've seen them. They're, they're tough, but it, it's real life, right? Yeah, and uh, we we can't even post them on the Facebook no, page, so we're not going to try. Be deleted forever. Uh, uh, so check out the patron if you want to if you want to see those. A witness to Williams' execution was actually a reporter y'all for the Garnett News Service, and he described it like this: uh, Williams leaned over a white podium and he looked at the witnesses as he spoke his last words into the microphone. I believe deeply in my heart that God has come into my life and saved me. I told the truth about what happened. If my death do happen, I would like it to be a remembrance in Louisiana and the whole country that it would be a deterrence against capital punishment and know that capital punishment is no good. Mm -hmm. I would like all the people that fought against capital punishment to keep on fighting, not just on my behalf, but on the behalf of everyone else. And then he continued with that article to say, uh, with that, Williams took four steps and sat down in the chair. Williams watched as the guards buckled the eight leather straps, each one about the width of a man's belt around the torso and limbs. The reverend motioned for him to hold his head up. Williams seemed to catch the eyes of each witness through the glass. The guards removed the handcuffs and then placed a chin strap, which held his head backwards. He did not struggle. In his left hand, he held a blue and white handkerchief. His body was immobilized except for his hands, which rested on the chair arms. He again looked at the witnesses. Hey, real quick, you know why they had the, the eight straps? Because they learned... On the previous one, seven wasn't it? Yeah, that's they, right. They, they got to the point where they strapped down, like nothing flying off, no meat's flying off. They just keep day. adding yeah. straps right. until until it works. When an electrode was placed on his head, Williams seemed to flinch slightly. His left pant leg was pulled up, and another electrode was placed on his calf. A brown cloth was draped over his face. His eyes are popping out. One of the execution room's center block walls was equipped with a two-way mirror. Behind it, unseen, was the executioner. Prison officials declined to disclose his identity. The guards left. Only Warden Maggio remained in the room with Williams. Maggio gives the thumbs up. Suddenly, Williams' hands and fingers jerked closed. His stomach muscles seemed to contract. There were four distinct jolts of electricity. Smoke and sparks rose from the leg electrode on the first and third wave. After the first wave, however, Williams showed no voluntary movement. So the, so that is a description of Williams' uh Electrocution, and then the last execution to occur in Louisiana via electrocution was that of a of Dalton Prejean. Mm -hmm. And this eyewitness account from a reporter in from the Times Picayune, which is the New Orleans paper, right. uh, gives this descriptive look. I arrived at the Louisiana State Penitentiary at seven o'clock on May seventeenth of nineteen ninety. Initially, I waited while the other members of the press at the warden's office. At 11.15 p.m., I and other witnesses were escorted to Camp F, which housed the state penitentiary's death chamber. While waiting for the execution, food and beverages were served to the witnesses. 
about 30 minutes prior to the execution, all witnesses, including myself, were escorted into the witness room. The room is small, built of cinder blocks like the death chamber itself, and completely walled off from the death chamber, which is visible by a four-foot by six-foot window. The electric chair sits squarely in the middle of the death chamber facing the row of witness seats. A podium with a microphone stands to the witness left of the electric chair, and communication between the death chamber and witness room occurs via this microphone. Just after midnight, Mr. Prejean enters the death chamber. He stood shackled at the microphone and made his last statement, which was, nothing is going to be accomplished. I have peace with myself. The shackles were removed, and he took his seat in the chair. Guards strapped him in, tight, tightened a second strap around his left leg, and attached a cap of leather to his head. The guards dropped a cloth hood over his face, concealing it from view. An, electri- an electrician then came into the death chamber and checked all the connections and turned on the fan. Mr. Prejean's hands were clenched and his chest heaved rapidly. The warden nodded to the executioner, and I saw Mr. Prejean jerk violently in response to the first jolt of electricity. He seemed to try to rise out of the chair, only to press more against the straps. On the second jolt, Mr. Prejean's right fist turned outward, and on the third jolt, a spark shot from his left leg in the area of the electrode, followed by a puff and smoke. After the final jolt, Mr. Prejean's body was still. We watched him for five minutes before the coroner and prison doctor approached to examine the body. The prison doctor lifted the hood and checked his eyes. They were half closed. His face was gray and his eyes were lit and lips were blue. The coroner briefly checked for a heartbeat and the prison doctor announced his death into the microphone. That's so hardcore, bro. I didn't Woo! want to interrupt you on any of that. You know very what? descriptive, too. Yeah, yeah. You very, can almost well, see yeah, it. I think when this came out in 1990, this article, there was no internet and, uh, right. and none of that shit. So this was the newspaper. That's how you got your jam every day, and these people could still write back then. Um, very descriptive, but Prejean did some very bad shit. But, I mean, it's still it's a tough way to go. So that was it. And 1991 comes, and Louisiana goes to lethal injection as a form of execution. And now the drugs you need to perform those executions, you can't, you can't get. And Louisiana, with the new governor who is tough on crime, and the death penalty is in the process of, you know, seeking out different forms of execution, y'all. And we'll keep you posted on that. So we told you a ton regarding the history of executions via electric chair not only in Bloody Angola, but in the United States with this episode. So next week, we're going to cover history of executioners, both in the United States and in Bloody Angola. And we have the identities, y'all, so look for that next week. Yeah. And it's, it's very cool. That, well, I'm not cool. Different that you got the identities because I, I know one of the reasons they used to keep them secret is to keep the families and shit from retaliation uh, against them and stuff like that. A hundred percent. And not only do I have the identities of the uh, two executioners, look, there was one executioner from the state of Louisiana that conducted over 60 executions uh, and another one that conducted 30 plus, I believe, or something like that. Yeah, uh, here's the interesting thing. I have pictures of the second guy. Really? Yeah. Um, So, you know, it's going to blow your mind. It it blew my mind. And and I know a little bit about the history. Uh, And when I came across this stuff, I I just couldn't believe it. And it's a little more public than you may think. Yeah. Um, And so we'll get into that next week. But, you know, what you just mentioned, uh, discussing these alternate forms of execution. We talked about this on Real Life Real Crime Daily. Yeah, uh, they just did the first one. Um, this is nitrogen asphyxia in it, Alabama. Yeah, uh, they. Uh, I believe it was. Yeah. And, and anyway, they take all the. They they said it would have been, uh, basically appeared to be painless, except this dude held his breath for four minutes. Like That's a record a amount of yeah, uh, he was like fuck it, I'm not breathing. Well, and when you know the breathe, first no breath o- you do, no is you're done. done. Yeah, so I mean, 
I think that's pretty cool. I mean, fire. Uh, look, some uh, states are looking into firing squads. Firing squads. Oh, Louisiana is. Louisiana's looking into that one that they just used in Alabama. And, uh, or maybe it was hanging there looking at bringing it back. I can't remember which one, but they're looking. Uh, um, they Jeff look Landry's looking at hangings? D- 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 different things. Wow. So I think they ought to make it public. You know, I mean, it, the it, if it deters one person, that's what they, you know, they say for a deterrent of crime to be uh, effective, it has to be swift and certain. Mm-hmm. Well, none of these executions are swift because of the amount of appeals and all that. And oh yeah, the certain part, like on these botched electrical uh, um, electrocutions and shit like that. You know, I don't know. Yeah, and it, 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 it most of the people that get sentenced to death row right nowadays get off a death row and get life in prison or. Well, like in Louisiana, you got people that die on death row because they're old as fuck now because of the appeals process. Yeah, yeah, it takes it takes uh, uh, well, decades. We got, uh, we got in the, most the cases. one um, the oldest one now on death row is from Livingston Parish, and he's been there forty eight years. Really? Yeah. Him and his his lover killed that. Oh uh, yeah, you did that. You did that on real life. Raped crime, him, and, and then the, and his lover that helped him torture and rape this little boy before they killed him inside the river. He actually died on death row of like cancer or some shit. Oh now, I mean, this dude's God. been 48 fucking years, all pills exhausted. He's just sitting there. And, and you know, this, this guy in particular that what he's talking about, there's no doubt he did it. Like, yeah. Yeah, yeah, like yeah, yeah. there's he not going to be that, anything that, to come uh, out, uh, you know, well, oh, he, he didn't even, do it. even if, I mean, there's no doubt about it, but his appeals have been done. Mm-hmm. They, the Supreme Court, everybody's rejected it. He's just waiting on a death date. And, and there will be no phone ring on the fucking wall because all that shit is exhausted. He can't go anywhere. And the interesting thing is that the longer they're there, the older they get, yeah, the more boy, expensive it is to house and them. And guess who has to pay for it? Yeah. Well, we're not the appeals process. Whatever parish you're convicted in, that parish has to pay for the whole appeals process. And it costs millions and millions and millions of dollars. These each one of these appeals process like ten, fifteen million dollars where to house them for the rest of their life probably costs six or seven hundred thousand dollars. Yeah, that's yeah. but that's you know what? Crazy. Fuck that. That some people and it's like it's a club nobody wants to be a part of and until you've seen the shit that I've seen and what the family members had to go through and the so what some of these victims had to go through. Some people deserve they don't deserve to breathe. And it's the law of land. I didn't make the law. So. That's right. And, and you know, you never want anyone, of course, to, to be. And it has happened. Though. Yeah. Someone's been on death row and come to find out they didn't do right. it. Right. And so you don't, you know, nobody's saying that we want someone to get convicted and the next day they right. get executed. Right. I mean, right. there's got to be a time process. Let's right. make sure we get it right. right. But not 48 years. Right. Not well, not 20 I mean, years. Our, know, it's too long. justice system isn't perfect, but it's the best in the world. Amen and, to that. Uh, uh, just think of a place like Saudi Arabia. We talked I mean, about that on I mean, the Daily how many, Show. How many, uh, how many appeals do you think those cats get? Stoning them. Uh, yeah, stoning yeah, stoning them till to this day. Chopping off arm and a leg. You know, and shit. Just, uh, uh, and chopping off heads. Yeah. And that executioner is famous. He does, like, public tours. Yeah. There's no doubt. And look, we also want to put a quick shout out there. A couple of things. First, if if there's something that you'd like to hear us cover that relates to uh, Bloody Angola, give us uh, give us a message. Those parole officers that are living on the B line, and maybe get I don't know if the state allow them to because of civil service, but maybe get uh, their side of the take on what. Yeah, they or a retired one. I mean, I mean yeah, right, right, might right. be retired someone that's retired that. Yeah. So if y'all listen, would like to come on. You worked the Bloody, and if you worked in Angola, whatever you want to come on. And uh, share your story so everybody can get a deeper inside look. Let us know. Yeah, we love doing the the interviews. We learn as much as everybody else right, during right, them interviews. Right. A lot of times things come out, and, and we're like two kids in a candy store watching right. a TV show, yeah. listening to some of these guys talk. So I know there's a, a couple of ex-wardens, and you know who you are, that listen yeah. to our show. And uh, we'd love to have you come on. Come on, on here and let's talk. Angola. It's not live. We can cut out stuff. That's right. <laughs> Anything you want. Yeah. If we say something we didn't want to say, but uh, we'd love to have any any of you on. Uh, and lastly, 
Uh, you hear us talk about a lot. Best banker ever, Lori Johnson. Best she's, banker. She, she is, and she's a huge supporter of really everything we do, whether right. it's Bloody Angola or Real Life Real Crime, Real Life Real Crime Daily. Local leaders. Local leaders. She she is uh, such a, a – just a good person and supporter. And she was actually, she's actually doing a Dancing with the Stars thing to – uh, raise money for the big buddy program, which uh, they have those pretty much in every area of the country. So no, no matter where you're at right now, you're probably familiar. Right. Um, and the way that they do it when they raise this money is you get a vote and you you just vote for one of these dancers. Uh, and it's like ten dollars for yeah. a vote, but it all goes to the big buddy program. Right. It's completely great, tax great, deductible. Great, great. Uh, program. If yeah. you have one one kid that doesn't have a you know a dad or whatever, uh, a male figure in his life or a female figure in their life, you know, it's a positive figure, and they can you get one kid, you reach them. Yeah. Right? Then and then it's just you know, stop them from going to bloody Angola. That's for sure. It'll change your change your life and their life right. and your life. So it's a wonderful you know? organization. It really is. And shout out for Lori. For yeah, sure. absolutely. Completely tax deductible. So what we're going to do is put the link. If you'd like to participate in that, we'd love for you to do it. And uh, someone that really gives more than she ever takes from right. her community and, and right. life in general. Right. So we, we'd love to support yeah, her. And that. we can, hopefully we can get a video. Oh yeah. Dance. Yes. Yeah. I, I, I will I get understand, a video. Lori, that you've been working out and practicing all this stuff. <laughs> hey, shout out to uh, Lori's family too. They're huge uh, supporters. Huge, and, huge. And, her, and, her husband is is as good a dude as you'll ever he meet. Josh Johnson played in the in the golf tournament. Yeah, like this, and he's a scratch golfer too. Doppelganger. Ooh. And then uh, her daughter. Yeah. Her oh, her daughter is the best, and well, both her daughters. Yeah, both her daughters. Yeah. Uh, are really awesome as well and huge support. Yeah, they just all support us. Yeah, they, great, great family. We get the chance to support so them back. Y'all, we, if you go in and we're going to put it on the Real Life Real Crime app and all our social media, uh, if you go in and you vote for and, and the you know, $10 a vote, tax deductible, I want y'all to post it so we can share and let Lori know that we back her. Yeah, we'd love that. And uh, so... That's it for today. That's it. The I know the the rodeo is going on. No, I'm sorry. That's uh, they have one weekend of the rodeo coming up in April. Yeah, that's right. And, and we won't be there, Jim. <laughs> <Mike, no. laughs> <Jim ain't gonna. laughs> but but we, I'm we've been promising this for over a year. We do have plans of going there. Yeah, and uh, uh, and it's been all we have to do is find the time and make the call. So, but anyway, it'd be awesome. Yeah, and and once we do that, we will put out an episode. Yeah, we're gonna do. We're gonna have some it's gonna that, be fire. I, the idea of it is to get inside the wire, and then we'll probably come up. Or Jim will come up with the idea for 150 episodes. <laughs> Everything from the museum to oh, we can talk about the death house to, uh, the, the, to the food to whatever. No right? doubt about it. So, anyway, well, thank you. Uh, lastly, to our patrons for supporting. Oh, yes. We couldn't do yeah, this couldn't do without, without the patrons. You. No doubt about it. I hope you enjoy your benefit. Yeah, I got a little something I'm gonna put up for y'all. I know Jim has another one too. Um, hope I mean. Just thank you, thank you, thank you for your support. And if you can't be a patron member, we get it. The uh, and you know, if you could just like and share and continue to spread the word on the number one history podcast in the world, New it's world. first year New out, you know, which is uh, we thank y'all for voting for that People's Choice Award. Yeah, and and uh, but they check out the Patreon, go to patreon.com and type in Bloody Angola or look on our social media. It's so many different tiers to offer so many different perks. Jim works yeah. so hard on all that stuff. Keep it all straight. We love and appreciate each and every one of y'all. Yep. And until next time, I'm Jim Chapman. And I'm Woody Overton. Your host of Bloody Angola. A podcast 142 years in the making. Complete story of America's bloodiest prison. Peace. Peace. I walk a straight line, shackled and chained. Oh, gruesome girdy, it's calling.
calling my name There is no mercy in this penitentiary Just ask the Hill String Gang Around